Good evening and welcome to the NDTV Dialogues, a conversation of ideas. Whom better to discuss ideas with than one of India's greatest living historians, Romila Thapar, with her new book, Indian Cultures as Heritage, Contemporary Pasts. Ms. Thapar, thank you very much for joining me on the Dialogues. It's interesting you've talked about contemporary pasts because suddenly the past seems omnipresent in our politics, whether it's about uh, discussing whose version of culture should dominate, whether it's about whose statues deserve to still be standing. Why do you think that is? Well, that's why I call it the contemporary past, because it's the way in which the past is being used for contemporary purposes. Now, in a sense, of course, there are people who argue that the past is always used that way. And uh, uh, there are very fine historians who've said that, that the best historians are those who understand the relationship between the past and the present and understand how the present is using the past. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, in a sense, uh, it, it seems to me quite logical to talk about the contemporary past because it's a contemporary use of the past. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, uh, there are periods in which there is not too much interest in the past, and there are periods when there's a great deal of interest. And I think we really have to ask ourselves, why is there this great interest? Um, Partly, I suppose, it's, uh, it's the kind of interest that developed all over the world at the time of nationalism. Mm -hmm. Because one of the, the components of nationalism is to bring the past into the present mm -hmm. and use it. And in fact, uh, Eric Hobsbawm, for example, has a lovely comparison where he says that history is to nationalism what the poppy is to the opium addict. So, so in fact, then, when we look at contemporary nationalism, if you want to put it that way, perhaps this kind of uh, tearing down of the past, whether you look at it in the physical, whether it's about statues or whether it's about challenging ideas mm. that seem to have dominated Indian historical thinking over the years, is natural. And in a way, if a particular party or ideology has won the democratic battle, in a sense, does it make sense that they then have the right to challenge all the assumptions or history that we've studied so far. Statements about the past and they have to be based on the logic of causality and the reasonableness with which you're making connections. If B comes after A, you have to explain why um, and not just assume that the two are interconnected. And then finally you get to the stage where you make a statement. Now even when you make a statement, I mean, we're all aware of what we um, in, in our circles called the paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. This is very common to the social sciences. There's one way of using an explanation to explain the data. Someone may come with a better explanation and that same data is then subjected to the better explanation mm -hmm. and the paradigm shifts. So that is a very important aspect which in a sense annuls the need for a whole sort of wholehearted, uh, desperate, almost, you know, ruthless attack on people, as many of us have been subjected to, mm -hmm. um, where you can say quite simply, all right, you, this, this is your view, my view is different. Mm -hmm. Now, ideally, this is what goes on in the, the circles of scholarship, uh, history everywhere where it's written, you have a generation after it's written, someone comes along and says, you know, they haven't consulted this source, or this is really not the way to look at it, you can look at it differently, and so on. The problem arises when you need history for political purposes. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes, the attacks become ruthless, they become abusive, um, and they become the kind of attacks, you know, that all of us turn our faces away from. You've, you've in fact faced a lot of those attacks and in some sense Romalath Harper has become the kind of face of this left historians who have somehow uh, distorted Indian history. How do you react to those? Oh well that's, that's an old story. It, it, um, yes, it, it goes back a long way and it really started getting bad uh, the first time uh, the sort of the right was in power. Uh, the Moraji Desai government, where the, the members of the BJP wanted our history textbooks to be banned because we were called anti-Indian, anti-national. Uh, Murli Manor Joshi, I think, referred to us as academic terrorists, um, which I thought was really quite a compliment. <laughs> but anyway, 
that was when the attack began and it got more and more abusive as it went along. Then it quietened down a little bit. And then the second time with the first NDA government, there was again a fierce attack on the textbooks and, and so on. Um, and that was when it kind of zeroed in on just a few of us. And then from the few, it became me. Mm -hmm. Um, I have many explanations for why I have been picked. Uh, I don't know if you would be interested in knowing what I think about it. No, I would no. love to. Um, well, I think that the reasons are, first of all, that I deal with ancient history, which is considered sacrosanct in certain political circles, um, that I criticize earlier views. Uh, which I should not be doing. I should simply be repeating what was said earlier. And this notion that I have, many of us have, that education is to enable a student to question existing knowledge, because that's how knowledge advances. If you don't question knowledge, you're there permanently in the same place. But this is not approved of. You, know, you don't question knowledge, you accept it. All right, so that's one reason. Um, the second reason is, of course, that um, I suspect, and I may be exaggerating over here, I, I, I agree, but I suspect it's also that it's not for a woman to question the sacred texts. Mm -hmm. You know, It comes much more easily if a man was to do that. Mm -hmm. But a woman historian is expected to just carry on with what she's given and not ask questions. Well, thankfully, you ask more and more questions when well, you get in your latest one book. One has to, because the thing, the whole the point is that, you see, there's been a shift. There's, and, and, and it's understandable. These attitudes are understandable in, in terms of the political shifts. There's been a shift from treating history as indology, which was very good in its own way. It taught you how to sort of examine sources and read ancient scripts and this, various things. Um, but at the same time, it was a narrative, and it stayed at being a narrative. Then came the social sciences, and as history moved into the arena of the social sciences, the question, the, the issue of questioning the sources and coming up with explanations that were different became a very live issue. Mm -hmm. And that's where the deb debate is amongst us as professional historians. We're constantly questioning each other. No, but of course, as you uh, pointed out, the debate is now with professional politicians. And it's we've, now, yes. And in, uh, we've seen in states like Rajasthan, where in fact textbooks are going to be rewritten to actually change the facts of history, yeah. how Maharana Pratap did mm -hmm. in, a, in a battle, how uh, it, another person, another say Hindu king or a mm -hmm. symbol of a uh, period, period is period. going to be wiped out. Uh, with Uttar Pradesh Chief Minister says first that the Taj Mahal is not a monument of Indian culture. Mm -hmm. how, how do you react as a as a historian, and even just as an Indian, when you see this well, being done? Well, as an Indian, I react uh, very fiercely, because I belong to a generation in which we grew up where Indians, being Indian, meant a very inclusive, all-inclusive category. And we had to know the culture of everybody, from top down and from here to there. This was all the excitement of being <clears throat> part of a, a, a cultural tradition that had many inputs and that had many uh, ideas and, and uh, issues coming in which were debated and discussed and written about and so on. To narrow all that down and say that the identity has to be a single identity, that this identity is the superior identity and is the identity that is going to color the whole notion of what is Indian, this is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. This is unacceptable to me as an Indian. And then as a historian, it's not only unacceptable, but one sees that it is completely flawed. It doesn't stand the test of historical analysis. So for instance, Aurangzeb Road being renamed the Taj Mahal, and you've written a yeah. great deal on this. Tell us, why do you think it would not stand the test of history of facts? Uh, because the kind of history that they are trying to bring in and, and replace the existing history with is not based on evidence and it's not based on reliable evidence, it's based on fantasy. As you said, I mean, if now tomorrow the, the, the history textbooks are going to talk about Rana Pratap having won the battle, <clears throat> uh, what does the historian do? This is, this is a complete negation. And you, as, as a historian, you cannot accept this and you cannot teach this. But are you going to be forced to teach it? 
And that's a simple issue, and it moves to bigger and bigger issues. And the sad thing is that this kind of history is so politicized that they even forget that there are very, very um, provocative, interesting, um, in some ways, um, analytically challenging questions that we are dealing with in our studies of history. All that is pushed aside, and all they're concerned with is were the Hindus indigenous, were the Aryans indigenous. These are issues which are important to some people, but to most historians, we moved on from that. Mm -hmm. We're asking a different lot of questions. And to be constantly brought back to the questions that really began with colonial history writing, because that's where the root of this kind of thinking is, um, is quite galling that you know, your, your profession is being reduced to something that it shouldn't be reduced to. It is an intellectual profession. Mm -hmm. And this attack on um, you know, the intellectual side of the profession, the, uh, the attack and reducing it simply to you, you, you mutter certain slogans and, and you're OK. If you don't mutter those slogans, you're not OK. Um, this is unacceptable. The government has, in fact, now set up a committee to look at uh, rewriting textbooks, uh, a correction, they say, which is long overdue, and also to look at mythology and how, in a sense, that mythology can also be looked at as history with facts. The Ram Setu Bridge is one example, and uh, they're looking at other areas as well. Do you think, and again, in a democracy, that this, in a sense, they are saying they're correcting the wrongs of the past, not just maybe historically, but in a sense of it's a different, ver they've been voted in on a mandate which gives them a right to actually re-look re at this uh, glorification of Indian culture, as they put it. How would you react to that? You see, I think you have to separate here uh, the fact that they have been brought in on a, on a mandate which is a political mandate. It's an election, it's a political mandate. This mandate doesn't give them the right to interfere with the findings of professional groups. Those findings will continue, no matter what they do to the textbooks. There will always be historians, economists, sociologists, anthropologists who will go on writing and researching what they have been doing. So that creates a complete gap between the political ideology and what is actually happening. Now, for purposes of the political ideology, history becomes very important because you're basing yourself on it. I mean, uh, when you look at the writings of uh, the, the Hindutva ideologues of the 1930s and the whole issue of Hindu Rashtra, for example, the argument is that the Hindus were the original indigenous inhabitants of this country. Hinduism is the religion of this country, and every other person is alien. Um, but history doesn't support this. Yes, history supports the fact that various groups of religious thinkers contributed to the making of Hinduism, and it does become a very major religion, which we've all looked at and researched and so on, which needs to be researched. Uh, but the question of the, the, the Hindus today being descendants of the original population. This makes no sense, because there's no way of confirming this. Even the DNA reports that are coming in are talking about a very mixed population. So, so taking that point, and in fact, the RSS chief, the current RSS chief, Mohan Bhagwat, has made the same point that everyone born in India is necessarily Hindu. Do you accept the view uh, that uh, critics may have that there was, say, perhaps a hegemony of uh, historians? and? Uh, there was in a, a left version of history, and now this is a right version of history. And that's just part of this uh, current process of political and social churning. No, look, uh, as I said earlier, you have, now you have in history theories of explanation. And you have a variety of theories. I mean, when we <clears throat> argue professionally, um, we recognize the fact that there are a variety of theories. But those theories of explanation, which we debate and discuss and argue over, some are Marxist, some are non-Marxist, some are anti-Marxist, whatever it may be. And you know, there are different explanations from other sources as well. I mean, I'm referring to the Marxists because that's the one that everybody picks up at the, at the drop of a hat. All right, there are all these explanations, and these explanations will be in uh, debate. 
Now what you had was the dominance of a particular type of explanation, uh, which in terms of history was not supportive of a political ideology, but was supportive of a certain way of looking at the past. Then you have other people coming along and saying, no, we don't accept this explanation. All right, please provide another explanation. Don't provide a fantasy narrative. This is the kind of thing that we are battling against, that we don't want the replacement of a perfectly valid logical explanation, which you may disagree with, by a fantasy narrative. We, you want the replacement by another logical explanation, which gives you a different picture of what might have happened. And that the tragedy today is that it's not the left historians versus the right historians. It is generally um, good historians versus non-historians. Is, is, that, is that a problem, do you feel? Ram Guha has mentioned this, that the right wing then needs to develop their own public intellectuals in a sense, or develop the intellectual bench strength. But is that a condescending way of looking at it? It's not a condescending way. The point is that there has never been an intellectually um, investigative, analytical history from the right wing. Um, there, there has been in the past, yes. I mean, the colonial history was very much that. And nationalist history was in part a questioning of the colonial and part continuing it on. Now, what has happened is that the ideology of the right today, the, the, certainly of the religious right, is based very much on colonial interpretations. Mm -hmm. Now, they have to work out um, uh, an analysis and an explanation of history which is not colonial and is also questioning the kind of history that has been written in the last 50 years. I don't see anybody doing that at the moment. Mm -hmm. There might be somebody who will come along some point. But at the moment there isn't. So at the moment there is this disjuncture of trained historians versus other people for whom history is still a 19th century concept. We've been watching, and I'm sure you've been watching, dismay this whole thing of statues being bulldozed. Or whatever. There's of course again a sharp divide in that with some saying that it's a battle of ideology. If we won the battle of ideology, the statues must go as well. But when it becomes about bulldozing a statue of Lenin, defacing a statue of Periyar, even Sham Prasad Mukherjee in Kolkata, what, what do you think the larger message being sent out here is? Vandalism, which has now become something which people happily indulge in and nothing happens to them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think really that one of the crises that we face, and I'm going off the point a little bit over here, one of the crises that we face today um, is, uh, is the much deeper crisis of we seem to have no ethical values anymore. Ethics is in for bad times. And I think it's about time that that was, you know, it was, ethics was revived and people became aware of the fact that if you are uh, a decent society, you are an ethical society. And that lynching and vandalism and so on is not something that is acceptable should not be acceptable. Now, all right, you may get your thrill out of knocking down statues, but at the end of the day, what does this achieve? It achieves nothing, because partly the statues anyway are put up and they're there, and they sometimes are meaningful and they're sometimes not even meaningful. This is part of civil existence, mm -hmm. that you want to remember certain people, you put up a statue and so on. Uh, knocking them down is really absolutely of no use. I mean, you've got cynics on the one hand. Uh, I gather somebody was uh, relating to me a couple of days ago that there are people who were saying, oh, well, statues are only places where birds and pigeons come and sit. And they are drop things. Yes, <laughs> they're droppings. They're droppings. Um, now, I think that's, that's really quite cynical. But anyway, the, the main point is that these are like getting up and shouting slogans and saying this is nationalism. It's not. These are things we have to think about much more deeply. If we're going to talk about we are nationalists, what do we mean by this? What does nationalism mean? What, what does it mean to say that we've stopped being subjects of a king and we're now citizens of a state? What's the relationship between the citizen and the state, the duties, the obligations, and so on? We pay no attention to that.